Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday night Parashat Shavua class. Tonight's Shiur is sponsored by our dear friend and member, Sir Yaakov Medina, in honor of his Yom Huledet, his birthday this coming Shabbat, and I believe Sunday, Hebrew and English birthday. Kadosh Baruch should bless you with Arichut, Yamim, Beracha, Etana, Yeshua, Atzlacha, Bechol Masi, Adecha, and she lots of uh, um, beautiful things from you and your family, and should be Zochet to all kol abrachot kulan bezrat Hashem, amen Thank you very much, Rabbi. This week's parasha is a double. It's parashat matot mas'eh. It's the longest combination of parashiyot that we're going to read. And the beginning of the first parasha, parashat matot, deals with a war that was waged by Moshe and Bnei Israel against the people of Midian. The reason for this war was it as to act as revenge for what the Midianites did. The Midianites did as a result um, uh, for with Bilam, causing the Jewish people to sin and leading them to a, a very horrific magifa that took place in the end of Parashat Balak, continued with Parashat Pinchas. But as a result of what Bilam caused him to do, it was time to take revenge. Nekom Nikmat, to take revenge against the people of Midian. Upon their victory, after the victory of the, of the Jewish people following the war, the Pasuk tells us, Vayomeru el Moshe, Avadecha naseu et rosh anshea milchama asher beyadenu, velo nifkad mimenu ish. They said to Moshe, the people coming back from the war told Moshe Rabenu, Moshe, your servants took a census of all the men of war under our command, and you should know not a man of us was missing. It's a tremendous miracle. You go to war and no one dies. It's a great zechut. Every time you wage battle, you have to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So on a literal level, this was a great nes, nes gadol, that not a person was missing, not a person died. But it's what the Midrash writes on this pasuk that I want to explore with you today. The Midrash, actually, it's a Midrash Shira Shirim Rabba writes. The, what does it mean that not a man was missing? The Midrash writes, not a single one of them put on the tefillin shel rosh before the tefillin shel yad. That's the meaning of this Midrash. What does it mean that a man wasn't missing after the war? Not a person, not one person put on tefillin shel rosh before tefillin shel yad. Why? Continues the Midrash. For if any of them would have put on the tefillin shel yad, the tefillin shel rosh before the tefillin shel yad, Moshe Rabbeinu would not have praised them and not only that, they would have not left the war unscathed in peace. Chas v'shalom, there would have been more disastrous consequences. So the Midrash is clearly stating that the reason for success, that the Jewish people came back from the war of Midian in one piece, is, not, is only because they wore the tefillin in the proper order. First they put on tefillin shel yad, and then they put on tefillin shel rosh. So what is going on over here? So in order to explain this uh, Midrash, which will be most of the Shi'ur, we want to look at what is written in Parashat Shoftim. There in Parashat Shoftim, the Torah lists out the criteria for a soldier to fight in a war on behalf of the Jewish people. And one of the criteria criteria that would make the, a, a, a certain individual not be allowed to go to war the Pasuk writes, The officers shall ask and speak to the people who are willing to fight and ask them, Whoever is fearful and faint-hearted, let him go back and return to his house. And not let him melt the hearts of his brothers like his heart. So again, on a very simple level, it's talking about a guy who's scared. If you're scared, don't come to war. If you come to war and you're frightened, you may cause fright to your other members in the in the army, and we don't want that. In his commentary, Rashi brings the famous Gemara in Masechet Sota. There he says, who is a person that is fearful? Why is he fearful? Why is he frightened? Rashi says, because of the sins that he committed. He's worried about that he did so many Averot, and as a result of the Averot, he doesn't have the merit to be protected when he goes out 
to war. Maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to protect him and Chas Shalom, he might die, so he's worried. So we tell this guy, listen, you're worried because of the sins? Stay home. Better you stay home. Don't come to battle because, God forbid, something can happen to you. Now, the Gemara actually elaborates. What exactly is the sin that a person could do that would cause him to be scared and frightened entering battle? The Gemara says, if a person speaks, if he interrupts between putting on tefillin sheliad and tefillin shel rosh, that is considered a transgression on his part, and because of that sin, he is compelled, he is obligated to return from the battlefield. And this is the sin that the Torah is referring to, Mi'aish you're worried, you're worried because of the Avera that you did by speaking and interrupting between Tfilin Shaliyad and Tfilin Shalos. Now, this is great. It's a very famous Gemara. But the comment, the commentators struggle a little bit to explain what's going on over here. After all, there are 248 Mitzvot Ase, positive commandments, 365 Mitzvot Lota Ase, negative commandments. So what prompted the Chachamim of the Mishnah and the Gemara to choose specifically the Avera of speaking between Tfilin Shaliyad and Tfilin Shalros. Of all the other Averot, no, we don't, Lashon Hara happens constantly. Why didn't they say Lashon Hara? If you speak Lashon Hara, don't go to war. No, that's not what it says. You speak between Tfilin Shaliyad and Tfilin Shalros. What is special about this mitzvah specifically that we tell the, the fighter, the warrior, don't come to war? So, the to answer the question, we want to go a little bit deeper into the whole concept of tefillin and what it represents. The Khatam Sofer explains that the order of tefillin is as follows, what we know. First, we place the, the tefillin on our arm or our yad, tefillin shel yad, opposite the heart, and we recite the beracha of le'aniach tefillin. And then we tie the tefillin and we wrap it. Our Ashkenazi brothers, they put on, before they put on the tefillin shel rosh, they recite a second beracha of al mitzvat tefillin, and then they put on the tefillin shel rosh, because that is to the Ashkenazim, they consider that to be the completion of the mitzvah, so they they bless al mitzvat tefillin on that. The Khatam Sofer says, we could look at, at this idea with through an analogy. Imagine you had a certain country who wished to appoint a king over themselves. So the king said to them as follows, to the people, first, I want you to imprison this person, that person, this person, and that person. All bunch of people. The people who oppose me and oppose my kingship. And only then can you empower me to be your king. So it says the Khatam Sofer as follows. The Resha'im, the wicked of the world, are ruled by their hearts. They're controlled by their yetzir hara, by their evil inclinations. The hearts of the Sadiqim, on the other hand, are ruled by their intellect. They're ruled by their dat and their chokhmah, and by their neshamot. We spoke about this in our Mishle classes. So therefore, before you put on the tefillin as a crown over the brain to sanctify the ros, which is the intellect, the first thing you need to do, it's so imperative and important to imprison, to chain up the thing that is challenging that kingship, the thing that is challenging your int- that intellect, which is what? Which is the heart, which is your inclination. So we place the tefillin on the arm, we place it here, and we put our hand down where the, where the, where the bait, where the box of the tefillin is opposite the heart, so that it will be bound and shackled with the chains of Kedusha. Once you do that, says the Khatam Sofer, then it's appropriate to complete the mitzvah by putting the tefillin shel rosh atop the brain. That's what the pasuk means in Kohelet. Shlomo HaMelech writes in Kohelet, Lev chacham limino velev kesil lismolo. The heart of the wise man is to the right, and the heart of a fool is on the left. What does this mean? The Midrash explains his pasuk as follows. The heart of the wise man is to the right, refers to the Yetzir Hatov, to the good inclination, because that's been placed on the right side. 
and the heart of the fool is on the left, is in reference to the Yetzir Hara, which has been placed on the left side. The author, the Baal Tanya, the, the, the Likutea Amarim writes that the Yetzir Hatov, the good inclination, where is it located? It is located on the right cavity of the heart. The heart is actually in the middle of your body. If you look directly down, the heart is right in the middle. And on the right of that, just to the right, is the Yetzir Hatov. The Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination, is on the left cavity of the heart. So therefore, this is what the Chatam Sofer wanted to explain. That the purpose of the mitzvah of the, of the Tefillin Sheliad is to bind the Yetzir to chain and imprison the evil inclination, which is located in the left cavity of the heart. And that's why most people, we put it on the left hand, because it's facing, now the bite of the tefillin is facing the left side of the heart where the yetzara is. This is why, we. this is how we can explain the reason, according to the Arizal, why we wrap seven times, seven times around our arm. Now some of you are probably thinking, wait a second, I thought we wrap eight times. Truth is, it's really seven. We Sfaradim do seven full ones, and then two halves. The first one is actually a half, and the last one is a half. And there's seven full ones, in, uh, and there's six full ones in the middle. All right? And we just count it as eight, but in reality, there's seven. So therefore, why do we rap seven times? So says the Arizal beautifully. He quotes the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah. The Gemara says in Masechet Sukkah, Shiva Shemot Yeshlo Leyetzara. There are seven names, seven appellations to the evil inclination. And these names refer to the seven distinct aspects of forces, the seven klipot of the Yetzara. So therefore, when we put on the tefillin sheliad, opposite our heart, on the left side of our heart, to subjugate the Yetzara, we are binding seven times. We are binding its seven forces of the Yetzara with the tefillin's strap, of Kedusha. You know, every day we say in the Shema twice, three times a day. Rashi, probably the most famous commentator on this Pasuk, writes, Why does it say Bechol Levavecha? Bechol Levavecha represents plural. You don't have more than one heart. You only have one heart. The Pasuk should have written, One heart. That's what the word should have, re- uh, should have, should have wrote. Which implies two hearts. So Rashi says, with your two yetzers, with your two inclinations, the yetzer hatov and the yetzer hara. Because like we explained, both inclinations are located in the cavities of the heart. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us Jews to serve a kadosh baruch Hu with both yetzers, with both inclinations. So how do we do that? You transform even the Yetzir Hara into a positive good force to turn it into a Yetzir Hatov. The Gemara in Yerushalmi in Sota compares Avraham Avinu and David Amelech. There it says that Avraham Asa Yetzir Ra Tov. That Avraham made the evil inclination into something good. And Umaitama, and how do we know this? What's the reason? The Pasuk says, Umatsata Levavon Neeman Lefanecha. In reference to Abraham Avinu, which we, re- we recite this in Vaibarach David, the pair of Vaibarach David, we say that Abraham Matzata Levavon Neeman Lefanecha, all of his lev, all of his heart, which we said represents all the inclinations, was completely loyal to you, was Neeman Lefanecha. David, however, was different. David could not overcome the Yetzara completely. So what he had to do was exterminate it. He had to get rid of the Yetzer. And that's why the Pasuk says, in, uh, uh, by David HaMelech, Ve'libi halal bekirbi in Te'ilim. My heart has died with me. What part of the heart? If his heart died, that means he's dead. It's in reference to the, the Yetzer HaRa that he had no choice but to uh, exterminate it. So David, uh, Abraham Avinu, how are they different, Abraham and David? Abraham, when he looked at physical needs and physical activities, eating and drinking 
and uh, and playing and sport, whatever it was. I don't think Abraham Avinu was doing much sport, but whatever Abraham Avinu was doing physically, Abraham did it solely and purely for the sake of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and he didn't do it for his own personal pleasure. That's not what it was for him. Is it was totally for God. David Melech was not able to control his heart to that degree, so therefore he he killed it with one decisive blow. He distanced himself from um, the physical desires by through taniot and through tefilot uh, and, and self affliction. That there were many uh, moments in David's life where he did this. The Chachamim, based on this Gemara, say that there are really two levels of tzaddikim, two levels of righteous people. The first level, which would be the lower level, which is David HaMelech, it's, it's, a person has a Yetzir Aram and is tempted to sin, but he overcomes a Yetzir Aram, doesn't pay attention to it. And that requires a constant battle. It, con- it requires non-stop uh, vigilance. Why? So as not to forget, not to relax even one moment, because the Yetzirah can come very suddenly, at any moment, and entrap him, and, and, and bring you to sin, chas v'shalom. The second category, the category of Abraham, that's superior. Because now that he's subdued the Yetzirah, he's transformed it into a force of good. And therefore, he's transformed its potential into a design purpose. Now you reach the level of Abraham Avinu. Right? You found it. Now, based on what we said at the beginning, on the words of the Khatam Sofer, we can explain the ritual on how we put on the Tfilin, Tfilin Shayan, Tfilin Shadros. First, we bind and we chain the Yetzara by performing the mitzvah of Tfilin Shalyat. We don it opposite of the left chamber of the Lev, of the heart. And then we're ready to ascend the level of Kedusha when we don the Tfilin Shadrosh, when we transform the Yetzir Haram into a Yetzir Hatov by means of the Kedusha of the Tfilin. And that's the exact order. That's why we have to do it in that order. First, we wrap the strap of the Tfilin Shalyad on the left arm to subdue the Yetzir. The Tfilin Shadrosh, on the other hand, is placed opposite the brain. Now, what does the Tfilot Shelros, what does the Tfilin Shelros contain differently than the Tfilin Shelyad? The Tfilin Shelros has four passages, four separate parashiot, written in four separate compartments. That's why you see the, four, the, the lines on, your, on the bite. On the Yad, it's written on one cloth. But the Tfilin Shelros has four passages on four separate um, parchments. And also, it has two straps emerging from the tefillah, from the bite. One goes to the right, and one goes to the left. Why is that so? Well, based on what we said, it makes sense. The one that goes to the right corresponds to the Yetzirah Tov. The one that goes to the left corresponds to the Yetzirah And they're joined together in the back of the head with a knot, and therefore we symbolize through with that knot the transformation of the Yetzirah into the Yetzir Atov, the union of these two forces. The Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat, Shin Shel Tefilin Halacha Lemose Misinai. That the Shin that is written or engraved and carved out in our Tefilin Shel Rosh is a Halacha that was tr- transmitted to Moshe on Har Sinai. The Tosafot says that the Shin on the right side needs to be with three heads, the sheen with three lines, which is the normal way we write the sheen. And the sheen on the left side is formed with four heads. And there are a lot of reasons why this is the case. Some say it's the three is Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and the four is Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Belea. Um, uh, but, but a lot of reasons, but we're going we're gonna to go uh, in the same direction that we've been moving so far. And by the way, Shulchan Aruch actually codifies this in Shulchan Aruch, that if you don't have three and four, your, your tefillin is not kosher. You need to have on the right side three, and on the left side uh, four. Why? Why do I need to have three and four? So explain the Chachamim as follows. The, since we're talking about Yetzer Hara and Yetzer Hatov, let's focus on the word Yetzer. Yetzer means inclination. The gematria of the word Yetzer is 300. 
300 represents a letter Shin. So symbolic of this is that the letter is the letter Shin on the Tefillin Shel Rosh. The Shin on the right three represents the Yetzer Hatov, and the Shin on the left four represents the Yetzer that needs to be transformed. Why is the Shin on the left four? What for? What reason is it for? So Chachamim explain as follows. Normally we have three three pronged Shin. The one that has four has an has an extra vav on it. Four, it's an, basically looks like a vav. There's an extra vav. What does a vav represent in um, in in Hebrew? The vav represents whenever we see a vav like ve'ele hamishpatim, right? Ve'ele uh, the word vav, the letter vav is always mosif al inyan rishon. Mosif al inyan rishon. The letter vav adds to the previous subject. So the Vav, another Vav is added to the Sheen on the left side, making it a four Vav Sheen, symbolizing the Yetzirara that needs to connect it with the Sheen on the right side, the three Vav Sheen, symbolizing the Yetzirah Tov, so that it can be influenced, it can be transformed into a force of good. The Megalea Mukot writes, I was okay to visit his kever in uh, Krakow, Poland, a few years ago, one of the great, great Chachamim. He explains why we are we have to emboss these two sheens on the Tfilin Shelrosh, one with three and one with four, which which total seven. He refers to the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat. The Gemara there expounds the Pasuk. Lo yie becha elzar velo tishtachave leel nechar which means there shall be no strange God within you, nor shall you bow down to a foreign God. There the Gemara expounds and asks, Ezehu el zar sheyesh begufo shel adam? What foreign God, what strange God is in the body of man? Gemara says, Have omer ze yeserara. It is the evil inclination. So the Megalea Mukod asks, why is the Yetzir Hara called an El Zar, a foreign god? Why is it called a foreign god? So he answers, because the word Zar is an acronym for Zayin Rashim. Zayin is seven, Rashim is heads. And like we said before, the Yetzir Hara has seven forces of Tumah. In fact, there's a story in Masechet Kiddushin that relates that the this damaging these damaging forces of the Yetzirah appeared to Rav Acha, one of the Amoraim, uh, as a serpent with seven heads. And Rabbi, Rav Acha, in order to uh, annul or, or, or get rid of this serpent, he bowed down in prayer seven times in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and every time he bowed down, he beheaded one of the one of the heads of the serpent. So it's it's for this reason why the sheens on the tefillin three and four total seven, and why it's something that was given to Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai seven heads, because we have to be able to subdue the Yetzirara, the seven forces of Tuma that are found in the Yetzirara, and that's why we have. The two, the two sheens. Um, it also explains why we wrap the tefillin seven times, like we mentioned earlier. But there's one crucial difference with the tefillin shel yad, the tefillin shel yad, the arm tefillin. What are we doing? We're just holding the seven forces of the yetzara in check. We do that so that it doesn't lead us to commit an avera chas v'shalom. We hold it in check. But once we put on the tefillin shel rosh, we now abolish completely the seven forces of Tumah of the Yetzara. All the negativity is removed and all we're left with is the good, positive qualities. It has now been transformed into the Yetzer HaTov. David HaMelech writes in Tehilim, Sarim redafuni chinam umidevarecha pachad Princes have pursued me without cause. Sas anochi alimratecha kemotse shalal rav. 
But from your word has my heart feared. I rejoice over your word like one who finds abundant spoils. The Arizal writes that the Sarim, these princes referred to in the Pasuk, are corresponding to the 70 ministering angels of the nations of the world. And they're called Sarim, they're called princes because the singular form, which is Sar, which is prince, Shin Reish, stands for, again, Shiva Rashim, seven heads. David HaMelech is saying here that these Sarim, these bunch of seven heads of evil nations, were pursuing me. And they call and they, they caused me to be entrapped, to be subdued. I had a very I had difficulty with the Yetzir Hara. And not only that, I feared that it would be something permanent. It will cause me to lead to more and more sin to Akadosh Baruch Hu. So therefore, David Amelach concludes by saying, How I overcame that Yetzir Hara. He says, Sasa Nochia I rejoice over your word like one who finds abundant spoils. Your word here in reference to the Torah. But as we see, maybe the word sas could mean something else. There's another a small anecdote in Masechet Brachot, 5th chapter, where Abaye seemed to be in a little um, uh, mood of humor. And it's not something normal for one of the Chachamim to be jolly and uh, goofing around a bit. So his rabbi called him out. His rabbi, Rabba, Rabba, told Abaye and said, You're not listening to me? Can't hear? Is that better? Maybe that's better. Um, the, uh, so there was, there was a story of, you have, to mute, you have to mute yourself. If you're on the shore, you have to mute yourself. Otherwise... Uh, we can't, uh, we can't hear. All right. Keep yourself muted. Thank you. Um, so the story goes with, with, um, with Abaye, who was in a very, uh, jolly mood, not something normal. His rabbi called him out. Rabba. He says, Abaye, what are you doing? What are you doing over here? Wait, wait, you think it's a joke? We're in yeshiva. We're studying here. You're jumping around, cracking jokes. What's happening? What did Abaye answer him? Abaye said, Rabbi, don't worry. I'm wearing my tefillin. I actually taught this Gemara this past year to my students in, in school. And, um, and I asked him, well, what do you think this means? Well, why, why, how does Abaye's answer appease his rabbi? So I got a lot of good, the, the, the obvious explanation is when you're wearing tefillin, you're still, you, you keep yourself grounded. You know where you are. Um, and therefore, therefore, it's okay. Like, I'm not going to go crazy. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm wearing. I'm wearing my my, my tefillin on my head, and I'm fine. But based on what we're saying, maybe maybe we can explain differently. Sas anochi al imratecha. Sas imrati, uh, uh, sa, sa anochi imratecha. I rejoice over your word, which alludes to the mitzvah of tefillin. We know, la yehudim ha'ita ora v'simcha v'sason v'ikar. Ora v'simcha, sason v'ikar. Four things. There in the Gemara, Masechet Megillah says, sason, sas is tefillin. The mitzvah of tefillin. Why? Because the word sas alludes to the two shins, shin shin or sin sin, the two shins on the tefillin, tefillin uh, on tefillin shalrosh, one of three and one of four. So therefore, David Amelech was saying, sas anochi alimratecha, in the merit of the kedusha of the two shins, of the sas, of the shin with three prongs and the, sh- and the shin with four prongs, that's how I was able to overcome my enemies and vanquish those seven heads, those sarim, those shiva rashim, uh, the nations of the world uh, that were out to get me. Um, when we put on our tefillin shaliyad, we put on, we, 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 we know we put on the yad, we wrap seven times, we put on the tefillin shalros. The, the Baal Shem Tov says an unbelievable chidush in a Mishnah in Perkei Avot. There he says, the Mishnah that we all know, we're very well aware of, Ezehu Gibor HaKovesh Etitzro. Who is considered mighty? Who is considered strong? One who conquers his Yetzirah. So the Baal Shem Tov asks, it seems to be that there are two types of mighty heroes here. The fact that the Mishnah is asking who is mighty, who is strong, that means there's what to choose from. 
Um, but if if there was only if there was only one type of strong person, then the the appropriate question should have uh, been me who gibor, right? Me who who is the strong who is strong that guy. But ezehu implies that there's more than one. So where does he explain? Look at the Baal Shem, beautiful Chidush of the Baal Shem Tov. He says there are two approaches, believe it or not, to combat the Yetzirah. The first is to merely fend it off. Is that when the Yetzirah attempts to persuade you and persuade a person to commit an Avera and a sin, then you fend it off. You evade it. You run away. You push it away. And you stay clear of it. The second approach is more admirable and more effective. And he says, the person doesn't just fend it off the Yetzer, but actually what he does is he conquers it. He's Kovesh Yitzro. He transforms his Yetzer into a positive force for the good, which he then uses to better serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. For, for, for example, if the Yetzer Hara persuades him to act foolishly, to, to speak Lashon Hara in matters pertaining to Olam Hazeh, then use that same energy to go and study Torah, to perform the mitzvot joyously, energetically. Use the words, instead of the words for Lashon Ara and Rechilut and Motzi Shemra and Yivud Peh, use your words to go engage in the same Torah. Redirect whatever is causing you to sin for the good. Uh, if it's jealousy, then fine. Uh, redirect the jealousy to be envious of those people who study Torah and perform the mitzvot. Kinat sofrim, tarbe chokma. The, the Gemara Bab Batra says that jealousy among scholars increases wisdom. If I, I want to be jealous of a person who has uh, who has a higher level of wisdom than me, because that's how I attain wisdom. That's how I can acquire wisdom. Here's an analogy, says the Baal Shem Tov. Imagine there were shopkeepers of a particular town that were having trouble with uh, thieves. And they would break into the store at night and they would steal whatever they could. It was a big problem. Some of the shop owners, they decided to hide in their stores at night. And when the thieves approached, they started screaming and hollering and, 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 uh, and banging on pots and pans to, to scare them. And they worked. They ran away. Other owners were a little bit smarter. Uh, they tried a different tactic. They also hid in their stores at night, but they didn't holler. They didn't bang on pots and pans to scare them away. On the contrary, they allowed the thieves to enter their stores. And once they were able to enter, they caught them in the act and they imprisoned them. So if you compare the two tactics, ask yourself, which one is better? The first group definitely scared off the thieves uh, with the yelling and the screaming. But after several weeks, when several weeks passed by, the thieves say to themselves, okay, it may be safe for me to come in again and try again. I'm confident that the situation is, has, has calmed down. The shopkeepers are now at their home. They're not thinking of coming back. And they will enter the store and steal. But the second group, they don't, have, they don't pose a threat anymore because they're now in prison. They were caught. So they're the same thing, says the Baal Shem Tov, in combating the Yetzir Hara. If it's just warded off and, un, and remains unconquered, then it's likely to return when the moment that you're vulnerable, the moment when you're not looking, it will entice a person to commit an Averachas shalom, confident that the person's guard is down. But when a person actually is able to conquer his Yetzirah and imprison it and transform it into the good, then not only will he not commit an Averachas, but he will use that to improve his Avodat Hashem and, and, and his Yirat Hashem. So that's what the Baal Shem Tov says. Ezehu Gibor, which one of the two is a better hero? Which one of the two should you choose? The one who just fends off the Yetzir Aram? Or the one who conquers it and employs it in the service of God? The answer is, HaKovesh Yitzro, the one who conquers it, the last one. That's the one we have to go through. So therefore, that's, that, that is our goal. That is whatever it is that we're, when we fight, when we face the Yetzirah face to face, that's what we have to have in mind. The problem is, that's not easy. It requires time. It requires effort. It requires experience. Initially, a person still possesses evil inclinations. We all do, and desires. So at first, you have to fend it off. 
The first time a person is is confronted with a yetzera, he can't he can't David Amelech couldn't even do it. He felt he couldn't even do it. But so you got to start by fending it off and doing whatever you can to push it aside. And and, and at that stage, um, even if he believes that he's serving a kadosh baruch Hu, uh, with his yetzer, he's fooling himself. He hasn't reached that level yet. It takes time. So the proper approach is do, to do things within one power to evade the yetzera and fend it off and push it off. Now, once you're able to, you've refined your nature, you've subdued your yetzera to a point where you're a, where you believe that you can transform it to something good with which to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu and achieve the level of HaKovesh Yitro, Hazaku Baruch. That is the proper protocol. That is the order. With that understanding, now everything makes sense. Why it's prohibited for a person to stop, pause, interrupt, speak in between the dawning of the Tfilin Shel Yad and the Tfilin Shel Rosh. Because this protocol alludes to the proper order of serving Hashem and combating the Yetzara. First, the Jew has to put on the Tfilin Shel Yad. He has to bind it around his arm seven times. And upon accomplishing that, when you finish wrapping seven times, don't stop. You have to immediately ascend to the higher level. You have to you have to rise up to the next spiritual level, serving a kadosh baruch hu like the tefillin shel rosh by conquering the yitzhara and transforming it. Hakovesh yitzro is the highest level. If chas v'shalom he is interrupted, or he interrupts himself between these two steps, then God forbid the yitzhara is liable to sense that weakness and overwhelm him and take control and cause him to sin. And this is what the Pasuk means. Who is fearful and faint-hearted? This is the person who is fearful because of the sins he, who, uh, that he committed. The Gemara interprets this person to, a, uh, to a, uh, an, an individual, a Jew who speaks in between putting on his Tfilin Shel Yad and his Tfilin Shel Rosh. It's a huge sin. It's a huge sin. Why? But now it all makes sense. Such an interruption makes you vulnerable to the Yetzara. Why? Because it hasn't been conquered yet. You're still in the process of, of fending it off and evading it. And now you're stopping? Why don't you reach to the next height? Why don't you go straight to the Rosh? To the two sheens? To conquer the seven heads? But you didn't. You stop to speak to your friend. You stop to look at your phone. You stop to do something else that wasn't important. So therefore, the Gemara says, It's in red. The guy who doesn't go to war, the guy who must come back from the battlefield is a person who is fearful of the Averot. The Averot that are on his arm. Why say Averot Beyadot? Why not say Amitiyareh Mina Averot? Fearful from the Averot, no, it's Averot Meshubiyado, the Averot that is on his arm. The influence and the persuasions of the Yetzirah that is eluded by the left arm, opposite the left chamber of the heart. And that explains beautifully what the response of those people who went to war in this week's Perashah told Moshe Rabbeinu. Your servants, referring to themselves, we took a census of the people of everyone that was under our command, and not one of us was missing. And the Chachamim say, what does it mean not one of us was missing? Because none of them donned the Tfilin Shel Ros prior to the Tfilin Shel Yad. The order, the protocol was correct. First it was a Tfilin Shel Yad. It was defending. It was the seven wraps of imprisoning and chaining up to Yetzirah, and then it was a Tfilin Shel Ros. They're teaching us that if one, if a person, God forbid, does the opposite, if a person serves HaKadosh Baruch Hu first like the Tfilin Shel Ros, believing that he is, that he immediately is able to transform the Yetzirah into good, positive force before he did step one, offending it off of the, like the yes, Tfilin Shel Yad, that individual, you're not worthy to come to battle. You're not qualified to be among the ranks of soldiers who are battling the Yetzara because you're going to fail. You're going to fail. It's a step-by-step process. Because ultimately, if you do that, the Yetzara, God forbid, will overwhelm you and will defeat you. Therefore, you have to follow protocol. First, you perform the Tfilin Shaliyad. We thwart the Yetzir. We ward it off. 
We tie it up. We lock it up in jail. We chain it with heavy-duty handcuffs. And then we perform the Tfilin Chilros. We conquer the Yetzir. We're, we're able to be Koveshe Titro at that point when we put on the Tfilin Chilros on top because that represents the true intellect, the highest level of Kedusha. When you have the two straps coming out of the bait, the left strap and the right strap, joining at the end, tied up as one, saying, I'm able to take this Yetzirah that I've been born with and push it to do good. Push it to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu and serve God using both inclinations. With both your Yetzir, Bezrat Hashem. We should focus on this very important mitzvah of tefillin. Make sure not to talk in between tefillin shel yad and shel ros. And now we have an extra kavana. Now we have an extra thing to think about when we when we don our tefillin every single morning. By putting on the tefillin shel yad, I'm saying I'm warding off the evil inclination. I'm willing to fend it off, do whatever it takes. And I'm not going to pause. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to get to that next level. I'm going to get to the level of tefillin shel ros, the level of kovesh etitro. That's what makes me a strong man. That's what makes me a warrior. That's what makes me someone who is not afraid, who will go out and will go fight and we will win. Wishing you all a wonderful night.